Um, welcome to everyone today. It's lovely to see such a crowd. Um, we almost uh, we almost need a bigger auditorium. It's, it's a real pleasure for me to um, launch this important series of forums on energy security. I don't think it's lost on any of us that we've seen an escalation in awareness and concern about energy issues um, among, uh, among governments, community, local communities, nations worldwide, um, and in ensuring that development is sustainable um, across the globe. This has been, I think, a feature of the last two or three years, um, although there have been many um, more knowledgeable than ourselves who have been saying for very many years that this is an issue to which we should attend. The quest for environmental sustainability traverses all kinds of spheres of activity. There are no easy solutions, there are no clear answers, um, and there are often quite difficult political decisions which face us. Many debates, many points of view, and some of them not particularly enlightening. This series of um, five forums seeks to focus on the science of energy options, not the spin, but the knowledge and not the polemic. As we go forward, it's vital that we as individuals and citizens understand better what the issues are. And I think this could be called the democratic imperative of environmental sustainability, that we do participate, we do have views, we do have ideas, and we do question received wisdom. So I'd like to congratulate the College of, um, of Health and Science at the university, one of our three major colleges, and the Whitlam Institute for this initiative and, and wish this craft well and all who sail in her. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Eric, and thank you, uh, Vice-Chancellor, for opening the proceedings. The phrase uh, energy security uh, came into widespread currency, I think, uh, nearly 35 years ago at the time Eric was just referring to in the mar aftermath of the first oil shock. Uh, what that was... Uh, for those of us uh, not quite so uh, long on the tooth as I am, was that in late 1973, the major oil exporting countries took control over production, export and pricing of the oil they produced from the US and European domiciled global oil companies, which had controlled the industry until that time all around the world. The immediate consequence was selective supply embargoes, which were lifted within a few months, but a quadrupling quadrupling also of the global price of oil, and that persisted. Since then, the term energy security has been used in many different ways to justify and explain many different policies and actions by governments, corporations and, and individuals. Nevertheless, despite their many differences, the various usages of the term energy security almost all have one common feature. They are concerned with the supply of energy to meet a largely unconsidered and unexamined demand. This uh, use of, the, of uh, the term, possibly seen what not say is its most egregious in the attitudes of most United States policymakers, the mainstream of them, and you know, one have to, has to presume the majority of US citizens to the usage of uh, petroleum fuels for their road transport. And it's usual for debate uh, on energy policy in the public to focus almost entirely on the supply side of the energy demand and supply system. Uh, and uh, what you can call it maybe a supply-side bias. Uh, we see lengthy discussions over what to do about supply of petroleum or electricity or natural gas. A lot of debates advocate one or more of a variety of many different ways we might be able to get our energy, different energy sources, new technologies, and all sort of seen as a one-off solution to Australia's problems. I think the reasons for this uh, bias in thinking, we don't actually think about how much energy we use, how much we need and how we use it, is that um, intellectually it makes a convenient conceptual framework for a large volume of technical, economic, environmental and social information. There's also institutional reasons that reflects the current organisational uh, structures where we see that uh, energy supply is provided by a relatively small number of specialist businesses some of which are very large and powerful, most of them really in a way, while demand for energy comes from every business, and every community, every consumer, millions and millions of us. Supply exists to meet demand, not vice versa. Policy and planning processes which ignore demand and consider only supply of any commodity or service are certain to result in economic inefficiency and waste, 
Um, I think it's appropriate to sort of start this detailed consideration by giving you how my definition of energy security. I think it means that all energy users, whether they're householders, small businesses, large industries, or people or material goods being moved from one place to another, should be able to have access to supplies of energy that are sufficient, reliable, and in the correct form to meet their needs for the energy services. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how we use energy. Uh, I've found it uh, very useful. The way I think about this is to div divide the way we use energy into three main uh, forms. Uh, mechanical uh, drive or motive power, and that's uh, what drives our uh, transport or any form of motile, mobile uh, equipment. Uh, and uh, so it's not only transport equipment, but also agricultural machinery, earth moving machinery, and so on. Um, the heat, that's fairly self explanatory, it's used uh, in uh, industry uh, large amounts, used in our homes to keep us warm, cook, make hot, make hot water, and so on. And uh, uh, the third one is electricity, and that's in some ways it's a special case because it can be used for the other two purposes as well, but um, it also can be used, as we all know, for a number of uh, types of uh, applications for which you can only use electricity like electronic uh, devices. Um, Just a couple of other points about the system. I think we probably know, and I've said, most of the electricity comes from coal-fired power stations in Australia. In the, eastern, in the national electricity market, that's actually... 86% because there are a lot, Western Australia there's a lot more gas in the system so that the national total is 80 to 81%. It's extraordinarily high, it's one of the highest in the world. Um, but um, there are lots of other ways that electricity can be generated and I think uh, some of the other speakers and uh, lectures, other lectures later in the series will be talking a lot more about this. I'll just run down um, a list and you can you don't need to sort of try and memorize this but the uh, this uh, coal integrated gasification combined cycle um, combined cycle gas turbine open cycle gas turbine uh, gas field reciprocating engine a biomass field steam or integrated gasification uh, with or without combined cycle nuclear hydro wind geothermal concentrating solar thermal photovoltaics Waves and there's a few more in the renewable portfolio that I haven't mentioned because they're uh, well, I might just mention tidal power because that has been talked about in Australia, but we don't really uh, need it, and the energy is nowhere, certainly nowhere near where we need it. The um, final thing to say about the electricity system is that it's got a long history going back. The way it's built now is to allow a small number of very large generators, mostly near coal fields, basically to distribute, to send, to transport the electricity outwards to consumers in a sort of radial way. And the rules in the National Electricity Rules, uh, I think, were really written to facilitate the perpetuation of this structure and mode of operation. And they were written by the organisations that were operating it at the time, uh, in the 1990s. And I think it would be fair to say that very little consideration was given to alternative structures that there might be for the electricity system or um, alternative modes of operation. Now, I'm not going to speculate about why that uh, might be. Some people you might say it's just a failure of imagination and forethought or a sort of human, uh, nat hum nat human natural unwillingness to change established ways of doing things. Some people have more inclined towards a sort of conspiracy, say it's deliberate to protect established economic interests. Anyway, um, the important point is that I think the rules and the way of thinking that they embody are a severe impediment to the emergence of an alternative structure of the electricity system, and I'll just I'll come back to that at the, at the end of my lecture. Very briefly, the other two energy systems that I mentioned, petroleum and uh, gas. The petroleum, that also, they all have these stages, petroleum is production of crude oil, transport by ship or pipeline, to the refinery where it's turned into petroleum products which are meet the needs of what, what we use, need as consumers, very wide range of different 